we got ourselves another yard sale find to just pick this thing up and uh i don't even know if this thing works came from questionable looking people only paid five bucks for it and that also included the crt so look at how nasty this keyboard looks mm -mm. don't you want to eat off that yuck it's gonna be tossed right away or tossed in the dishwasher if it even works this is a compact i think it's a desk pro or maybe it's a prosignia i need to look at the front i don't remember which <clears throat> let's see here i literally just bought it and loaded it up it is a compact desk pro i don't know what version it's a series pd 1006 so it's about the same generation as my pd 1000 prosignia basically the same thing it's a pentium 2 based system uh, i think it's a 266 i don't remember which we have two usb 1.1 ports some audio jacks and these are all labeled on the side there's no color coding because i don't believe this was before the standards of the pc 98 color coding system on computers this also has one of those little tiny egp video cards that have this weird low profile bracket which you don't often see on uh, other things it's like it's a little shorter than a mini card because there's the full size pci and isa slots up here a whole seven of them no, actually, let's count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, seven of them. So this is a full ATX system, kind of mounted in this odd case. And I believe we have a little boy. Who has a new GTR. <laughs> <laughs> Cheap jokes aside. Uh, I don't even know if this thing works. Literally, I just picked it up, paid for it, and just tossed my truck. Because honestly, I'm like... You know what? I need something to do this weekend or maybe when I get home. Who knows? But uh, stay tuned. There's going to be more on this right after the clip. Thanks to the magic of video editing. Hello, viewers. Here is another yard sale finds that I'm just ironically now getting around to filming because I've had to do other videos in the meantime or well, other video uploads because the video was already done. But this one I picked up last Friday on uh, what day was it? I forget. And there's a subtitle for it. So this machine I just picked up for the sole curiosity of, did it even function? Because I didn't even trust the people who were selling this thing. I mean, looking at the system unit is one thing because honestly, this is just all cleanable via some alcohol and a lot of scrubbing. And you can get all this mark crap, all the sticker residue off. You just gotta be patient. And stuff on the top you can easily clean off. Take an air compressor to the front case fan and also the power supply fan, which honestly the power supply fan is amazingly clean for how rest of the how dirty the rest of the system really is. But um, no, that doesn't even begin to describe the filth that plagued this computer. Let me describe you what I got with it. The CRT is still out in my truck, so obviously I'm not going to be able to, yeah. <clears throat> but I do have the keyboard. And also the mouse. Those are the original peripherals to the computer when it was new. Wouldn't you like to use this mouse every day? I'd like to eat off that keyboard? Mmm, -mm. tasty. That is definitely very sanitary. It's definitely on your protein list that you should eat off of really moldy, dirty keyboards that have cigarette grime all over it. I'm just kidding. Now, in the world of vintage computing, these Compact Desk Pro EN based systems, whether you get the Pentium 2 systems or the Pentium 3 systems or the later Compact Evo, uh, I think they're the D500 and D510 series computers, they all share one thing in mind and that is toollessness uh, design in the case. Basically, you can get this thing open and access vital components of the system without needing any tools. It's rather an impressive design that really it's starting to fade away in the computer industry, which is really rather sad because obviously the whole point of having a computer investment is to be able to keep your investment and being able to service your own computer even after the warranty expires would just be a nice thing to have, you know? But anyway, I digress. So on the back here, you can see four different thumb screws. They're green plastic thumb screws. Three of them hold the side panel itself on and I think they're just tapped with fine threads so you can actually if you lose the thumb screws you can replace these with fine threaded computer screws just fine and now we can actually lay the machine down on its side which actually does take two hands this thing is legitimately heavy and we can take off the side panel I'm not joking when I say this thing is heavy because it weighs a good 40 pounds. This case is steel. 
all the way around. There is no cheap build quality in this computer. Compaq knew how to build a computer and started with the case. It is unbelievably rigid and unbelievably tough and it's still not broken today. Take that in mind, modern computer makers. Anyway, here is the main motherboard and the riser board. I'm gonna go ahead and turn on my light and we'll take a look at this more closely. Down there is the Intel Pentium 2 microprocessor. This particular model is a 350 megahertz Pentium 2 with 512 kilobytes of level two cache. It also has some interesting compact thermometer sensor on the heatsink. <laughs> kind of interesting. I don't know if this machine has any kind of uh, fan speed control built into the motherboard. I'm not entirely sure if that's true or not. There's the cooling fan, which could use a little bit of cleaning, but it still works. And there's the internal speaker. This is not just, I believe, for PC speaker noise. I don't think there is any kind of a dedicated PC speaker on the motherboard. I don't think there is. I think everything is routed through that speaker, including the sound card. So you can actually route your internal sound card audio through the speaker. It's literally just a positive and a negative terminal. And I believe it's a basic little eight ohm speaker, but it does get decently loud. It's actually a very decent speaker for an internal speaker on a business grade computer. Obviously nowhere near the good, you know, volume capabilities of the desktop model, which had a slightly bigger speaker. At least I think it was a slightly bigger speaker, but nonetheless, you don't normally see those on consumer grade desktops. That was something of a perk when you bought a professional or commercial quality computer. Down there you can see the Intel i440BX Northbridge sitting under the microprocessor. And there is the Southbridge. I don't remember which one it is. I think it's like an ICH3 or something like that. Don't remember, I'll have to look when we get into the OS. There you can see the National Semiconductor uh, low pin count IO controller which does things like controlling the serial ports and the parallel port, as well as PS2 keyboard and mouse. So very basic stuff that you could just buy off the shelf for cheap. So one thing I forgot to mention was the three PC100 memory slots. This machine, I don't remember what the maximum memory is. This system shares a lot of similarities, I guess you could say, in the chips compared to my compact Prosignia PD-1000. This is a Desk Pro PD-1008 or 1006, one of the two. I think that's more of a six than an eight, uh, but it's a Desk Pro EN. Basically my Prosignia is a Desk Pro EP slash SB series. And rather amazingly, they still have the drivers for this computer online. Unlike a lot of more modern HP systems, HP Compact has actually felt the bother to actually keep the drivers for these Desk Pro EN systems on their system. So I will give props to HP for at least including that sort of thing, but please keep the driver support for all your computers if you can. That would be really appreciated. I don't care what generation it is, HP. Just keep that in mind, really, keep that in mind. One thing that's rather odd is the graphics card. You can tell it's a standard AGP graphics card. I think it's just a 2X slot, but We'll take a look at that in a second here, but the interesting thing about how it's mounted is that it uses this low profile bracket and it's also a double wide sort of thing there. And I want to say that you could have ordered a better graphics card that could have allowed for dual monitor setups. Back when this thing was new, Windows 98 actually had the support for dual graphics or dual monitors, just like the uh, the Macintosh when it came to the Power Mac G3 blue and white, I believe, you could also hook up dual monitors to it. So this was a very competitive feature, was having a dual monitor option. Down there is a Mitsubishi chip of some kind. I think it also relates to the serial port, I'm not sure. I don't wanna say that that chip right down there is the Flash BIOS. I think there's actually a compact branded chip that actually has you know, a sticker on it that pertains to the BIOS. And uh, right down in here, I also forgot to mention, this is the ESS1869 audio controller. And one thing that's very interesting is the audio amplifier that has a heatsink on it. I don't think I can get into it without having to take out the motherboard. Oh, there you go, you can, you can kind of see it. It's very hard to see, but it's a Philips TDA7056B audio amp. I think they read the numbers correctly. If not, I will double check when I get the motherboard out of this. But it's time to get into the toolessness nature of this case. And I probably just used a you know, long word there. 
Now this riser board is very unique to this computer. Basically, this is where your front panel connectors are connected. Obviously it connects to the internal speaker, the cooling fan power, the power switch, and the lights on the front of the case. They are all routed through this little proprietary connector. And it connects into this little back plane that way. And obviously we have our four pin CD audio connector routed to this board as well. So it'll obviously go down to the internal sound card and be played out your speakers. We also have our floppy drive connector as well as both our primary and secondary IDE controllers. And down there we have the 20 pin ATX power, which is rather odd for the system. And I don't know if it's just a lack of driver support, but I don't, I don't think there is an ACPI driver installed properly at the moment, but it makes me have to manually turn the computer off when I shut down windows. Kind of weird. Also, there's a chassis intrusion switch, so that way nobody tries to steal your computer. And there's some kind of a locking thing there. I don't know if that has anything to do with the, the front panel connector and this chassis intrusion switch, but it is right there. And I'm, I'm pretty sure this is some kind of like locking solenoid that you can activate in the BIOS. And this is to help protect your computer from being tampered with in a professional environment. There is no key lock on this computer, so I guess that's some kind of progress. But anyway, how this works is, oh right, we have to disconnect the internal speaker before we actually go any further. We have to literally disconnect it and unroute the cable before we can go any farther. And I have to be kind of gentle with it because this insulation is almost about as old as the, almost about as old as, you know, whatever. It's almost getting up to being 20 years old, so I kind of have to be careful with it because I don't feel like rewiring the little internal speaker. So then you take these green little slider things, and this is a two-handed job. But basically, um, let me see if I can do this here. Kind of set the camera right there. You kind of just pull it up like this, and out it comes. And you can quite literally just take out this entire center stack, and there you go. Now you can add your expansion cards. We have seven expansion cards or expansion slots, no less. Five are PCI, two are ISA, but one's shared between PCI and ISA because you have to make up your mind about which one you want to use. There's also a couple of little resistor packs there on the board as well. And some kind of extra Phillips chip. I don't know what for, but maybe it's some kind of speaker controller or something. There you can see the long proprietary connector that connects that back plane and connects the power to the computer. Kind of interesting that they wrapped the power through this connector. I didn't think that they would actually do that. I would have figured that it would have been a power connector on the motherboard. But as a matter of fact, that's not the only thing you can take out this computer. If you take out this extra thumb screw, and you guessed it, probably by now, you can literally slide out the motherboard on a tray, no screwdriver required, and there you go. It's as simple as that. And it also allows you to upgrade the processor, upgrade the RAM, upgrade the graphics card if you had the graphics card of the correct form factor, and also clean out the system and service the componentry on the motherboard. So let's get a closer look at that audio amplifier. It's a, yep, it's a Philips TDA7056B audio amplifier. Interesting that they had to throw a heatsink on it, but it makes sense that that's the audio amp because literally the audio jacks are right nearby. And by the way, this is the motherboard, so let's take a look at the ports. So we have two USB 1.1 ports. We have a microphone, a headphone jack, line out and line in, a PS2 keyboard and mouse ports. They're not color coded. This was before they, mad they had to actually enforce the PC98 color coding standard on OEMs. There's your parallel port. You have dual serial ports. And above that is your graphics area. Kind of weird that Compaq used that sort of form factor for the graphics card, but this is the original graphics card to the computer. Speaking of the graphics card, this is an ATI Rage Pro Turbo AGP, or what they otherwise would call in Compaq's terms, the 3D Rage Pro. And there you can see the little BIOS for the video card there. Now, this has four megabytes of onboard RAM. You can see each chip would basically be a one megabyte chip. And the cool thing is that they provide a sort of laptop style video memory expansion slot so you can upgrade the video memory on this video card. I don't suppose it would be any higher than eight megabytes or 16 megabytes of video memory maxed out on this video card. But back in the day, the Presignia that I own, which is basically a little earlier than this machine, but was more targeted towards the higher end customers as it has a 400 megahertz Pentium 2 versus a 350, uh, it came 
brand new with an NVIDIA Riva TNT 16 meg card. So obviously it had a bigger punch to the graphics than this thing did. But then again, this thing probably wasn't doing anything ridiculous in terms of 3D graphics. So obviously they needed to cut some corners there. But not that it's a bad video card. I mean, for the time, this video card probably could have done just fine. Right up here is the Visa feature connector, which was commonly seen in the 1990s on many video cards and onboard video solutions for many OEM computers, or motherboards for that matter. Basically what that did was it allowed you to connect up something like a TV tuner card, or maybe if your system had the capability of it through the PCI slots, a DVD video encoder, a dedicated DVD video encoder board, and it also allowed you to plug it into the Visa feature connector. And what that did was, instead of having its own like output through VGA to your monitor, basically it tied in with the video output of your already existing video card. And it allowed the software to control the output from this connector from the dedicated device in your expansion slot. So it's a very unique design that didn't really catch on because of course microprocessors got faster, memory got faster, and stuff just got a lot faster. So obviously um, things just got faster over time. So obviously uh, AGP graphics got faster and we dropped uh, the ISA slots. Taking a very slight but closer look at the, the LAN card here. This is some kind of Intel branded chip. It is an Intel SB82558B. Probably some kind of a decent LAN controller at the time, a 10 base T, I believe, maybe 10100 if I'm lucky. That cable you see allows for uh, the wake on LAN feature, which was definitely a new thing at the time. So this allowed the system to use the wake on LAN feature because it says network interface controller wake up on the motherboard, on the riser board here. This is a compact branded part, the Compact NC3121, but I believe you can just get away with installing the Intel SB82558B driver in a newer version of Windows or Linux, and you'd still get the same networking capabilities as the Compact NC3121 driver for Windows 95, 98, and ME, as well as 2000. And rather amazingly, this actually has driver support for Windows XP, and I don't know if that's just because I saw the Pentium 3 model, or if Compaq actually had driver support for Windows XP on a system this old. Well, not too terribly old because at the time, because this machine was made in 1999, keep that in mind, Windows XP was only a two year old operating system. So if driver support was actually made for a system such as this, it actually wouldn't have been too terribly bad because obviously a 1999 computer on an operating system from 2001, 2002, give or take, wouldn't have been too terrible but obviously it's a Pentium 2 running Windows XP, so you can't expect too terribly much. And reassembly of this computer is just as easy as the disassembly. Now I find this necessary to point out because you gotta watch out for these little plastic sliders. You have to line the expansion riser into those plastics so that way it'll slide down and then you have to watch out for your cables back in that area and gently slide it in. Don't force anything because of course this is nearly 20 year old plastic. But at this point, you can essentially reinstall your connectors before you put this all the way back down. And also watch out for this pesky metal tab. It's meant to be there to allow you to reconnect your connectors. So don't forget that's there. And what wouldn't be one of my videos without the necessary need of Before we turn the Compact Desk Pro on, I figured I would give you guys an update on the internet and how it's working. It's actually been working very well because obviously um, I've had to, you know, do some stuff um, like the E-Machines EL1300G, I had to update that thing. But now I'm finally able to patch 
the security problems that are with XP here on the old Pavilion A1477C. And it's not a massive improvement in performance, but I can at least now install security fixes when I need to install them. I still absolutely love that startup sound from the Final Fantasy theme that came on Windows XP. Any Windows XP system that is my personal favorite will get that sound effect because I love it so much. But no, I'm actually getting some security updates installed on this thing, which really isn't that surprising. But uh, as long as I can keep these XP systems up to date, and as long as I can keep the antivirus up to date, because obviously this is the last version of Avast that will run on Windows XP, at least program-wise, I don't know about security updates-wise, but obviously program-wise, this machine's not going any farther than 2017, because Avast themselves specifically said so. But yep, just a minor update on the internet, it's working a treat. So I'm having to do some cleaning, but forgive me for the mess. Here I have the Desk Pro all set up. I know it's hard to see, but uh, that's okay. I got the exposure ready for the monitor, so let's go ahead and turn it on. This computer was actually one that was built by Compaq, or at least that's what I think. And the reason why I say that is because it has a Compaq CD-ROM drive. It has uh, a Compaq equipment in there which is kind of unique in the world of computers to have the original equipment manufacturer actually make their own computers. And every once in a while, Compaq actually did manufacture their own systems. And I think later on they were made uh, by other people to reduce cost and whatnot. But this one, I believe, was actually made by Compaq themselves. So taking a look at it, this is an Intel Pentium 2 running at 350 megahertz. This has 128 megs of RAM. The BIOS is from April 14th, 1998. So this probably was earlier made or maybe some parts were replaced in its lifetime. So I'm assuming that this machine was probably made in 1998 and some of the parts were re or replaced. Who really knows for sure. So we have a three and a half inch floppy drive. Removable media. Now this is something interesting. I'm not sure what this is supposed to mean boot off USB or what the deal might possibly be or if you had a card reader you boot up off of it I'm really not sure Here you can see the original hard drive this is a 6.4 gig hard drive I believe it's a Fujitsu drive of course it's ultra ATA so it's a fast drive and uh, whatnot here is where you can toggle the smart cover or the chassis intrusion switch so obviously you can prevent the cover from being removed if you lock the solenoid. At least I think that's how that works. You can disable all sorts of things if you were to want to, you know, protect them. Energy saving mode. Mm -hmm, we all know how that is. And of course, the parallel port would have different modes, so standard or flexible. So I'm assuming that's bi-directional, I'm not sure. Or something like that. Bus priorities, PCI, and some other things, of course. PCI devices, ATI VGA controller, which apparently is on PCI bus, which I'm not entirely sure how that's supposed to work because it's an AGP card. And there's all the onboard devices and their DMA settings, so I don't want to touch those. So, let's go ahead and boot it up. Now, when I got this system, they had left all their software on here. As a matter of fact, I actually got some footage of the computer when I got it and all the software that was on it. So here are those clips now. Should just take its time to post, I'll give it that. Got bugs growing on this thing. Honestly, you got bugs all over this thing. Okay, they were right on it being Windows 98. Okay, good. Everything's just all over this thing. Ooh. That's just gonna get thrown in the dishwasher, I think. <laughs> I'll be amazed that the mouse works. It's just the ugliest looking part of the entire thing. Okay, I'll get this thing turned on and I'll be back. Click Attack County. Mm -mm. Well, it's not connected to their local network anymore, but of course we all know Windows 98 has that really advanced security. Uh, yeah, now we got a log.dat file. It's actually a lot less on here than I thought, because, you know, something owned by the state, you know, they leave all, they usually wipe the drive if it was owned by the state, usually. Okay, good, the mouse actually does work. But at the same time, ew. <laughs> Thank you. 
All righty, what else on here for programs? Ooh, we got Microsoft Word, PowerPoint, Outlook, Excel, even Access and Binder, not bad. Windows Media Player 9, so this has definitely been updated. Microsoft Games, a puzzle collection. Ooh, probably don't have the CD. <laughs> because usually these things require a CD. Let's see what else is on here, Acrobat 4.0. Can we sort this by name? That would just that'd make everything a lot better. Learning Company, ooh, look at all those games. Yeah, QuickTime 3.0, hmm. But I decided to wipe the drive, even though it had an OS already on it, because I didn't want to deal with all their documents and pictures and games that required CDs and stuff like that. So I actually decided to reinstall the operating system on this computer, but it wasn't Windows 98. It's actually Windows Millennium Edition. Just so I can piss more people off in the comments section. That was my intention with this, not really. The reason why I installed Windows Millennium Edition is because I actually don't own a Windows Millennium Edition computer. And I know it's probably not the best to be running Windows Millennium Edition on a computer like this, especially with only 128 megs of RAM. But I, it's better than running it on an Intel Celeron based system. So this one has a little bit more punch to the CPU and the memory and whatnot compared to the Celeron system I own. So. I currently have the Inside Your Computer theme set. And I was trying to get my USB wireless card to work because this thing right here is supposed to work as far back as Windows 98 second edition. So I don't know why it's not working, but I couldn't get it to function. So who knows, maybe there's some kind of catch with this whole entire setup, I'm not entirely sure. Anyway. Microsoft Windows ME, registered to me with Compact Computer Corporation. That's totally where I work. Interesting that it just says Family 6 Model 5 processor. It doesn't actually go out of its way to say Pentium 2. Don't know why that is. Anyway, 128 megs of RAM, which is probably more than plenty for Windows Millennium Edition, but you know. So here you can see the Compact CD-ROM drive. I believe this is an 8-speed, if not a 16 or something like that. And this computer actually does support the use of direct memory access. So actually, I'm going to go ahead and turn that on. And then I'm going to do the same thing for the hard drive. And I think we'll restart after that, obviously. We take a look at this stuff. There you can see the graphics is an ATI Rage Pro Turbo AGP. Or 3D Rage Pro if you want to have the compact fancy name for it. Floppy disk controller. has an Intel... Bus Master IDE controller, standard keyboard. It actually picked up my monitor, which is hilarious. It's actually a pretty common monitor. It has open drivers support, which is nice. There you can see the Compact NC3121 network interface controller, otherwise known as the Intel, whatever the gibberish was, I forget. Doesn't matter. There you can see the ESS1869 sound card. I believe this also has some form of general MIDI on it as well. There you can see the Intel 440 bx stuff since this is a 440 bx based system and the usb controller so let's go ahead and let this reboot because it's gonna put everything in dma mode which this system does support but i have to let it reboot so i'll be right back actually can i do the trick of holding down shift and then pressing alt y i don't know can i actually do the whole trick of left shifting and then have it go back out to dos and go back into windows or does it have to do a full reboot uh Dang it, it has to do a full reboot. And because I was holding down shift, it gave me a nice keyboard error. Because that's what I need is a keyboard error always. This actually looks a lot sharper on the camera than it does in real life, which is hilarious. It's some kind of dithering to do with the LCD panel. But I didn't have to install any drivers because that's the graphics card driver right there. Although it'd probably be a smart idea if I were to install DirectX 9 because it would just be a lot smarter to do it that way. Although... Who really knows if I'll end up doing that or not. One thing I do want to check before I go out and dink around with some stuff here is to check if we actually have MIDI support on the sounds. Or if I have to set that up myself. Where is that category? I think it's under sounds and multimedia. They combined all that sound and multimedia stuff in ME. So audio. It was not set for the ESS FM synthesizer. Good thing I caught that. And then while I'm at it, we'll just set the old Windows Millennium theme or something like that. Nothing too crazy, nothing too fancy, just something I felt like I wanted to enable. So, 
I kind of like this theme, although I don't like the way it dithers everything in the background, but who really cares? So, let's go ahead and pause that. I'm going to open up a MIDI here. So, Windows, Media, I'm going to open up One Stop. So the MIDI sounds on this. Oh, I gotta turn the MIDI volume up. Oh, it is all the way up. Wow, that is some really quiet MIDI. Wow. <laughs> the 3D effect really does do a good job on this system. Whoa, okay. <laughs> what? Okay, um, I gotta listen to that again. Some instrument in the MIDI screwed up. <laughs> These controls actually work? Wow, that's interesting. Well, let's see here. We're gonna take the resolution down to 800 by 600 here. I'm gonna try playing something on this machine. And this does not look very pretty on the desktop. I don't know why, but it is. Let's see if we can find a game that we can play on this system that'll it'll give the hardware a little bit of an interesting challenge. We'll give the old Half-Life a go. Ah, I gotta love those helicopters. Good thing I don't have to record this while I'm installing Half-Life. Alrighty, let's go. Turns out I didn't have to do any updating of DirectX since DirectX 7 is what this game is based on. And here we go. Gorgeous. This does a hell of a lot better than that Packard Bell did. <laughs> Although, I will give it for the Packard Bell it actually launched the game. But this is more era appropriate for this game. Running on a dedicated OpenGL graphics card and whatnot from the time period. This will certainly be a lot more fitting, so configuration. So video modes. So let's see here. We want OpenGL. Credits the current version of blah, blah 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 blah. Okay. And then we have to keep spam click the button or spam click the window so it doesn't try to load anything. There we go. And we don't want to do OpenGL at 640... What? The hell is it doing? Okay. That's not weird at all. What the hell just triggered it to shut down? That was weird. Okay. Um, I, ha I have to admit, that was just freaking weird. Why did it just restart? Cause it just re it just rebooted out of the blue. I didn't even do a thing. Well, that's rare. I didn't have to launch scan disk, really. That's weird. Let's try this again. Wonder if this thing would perform any better or worse if I were to take the graphics card out of that bracket and toss in the Riva TNT from the Persignia, which I have someplace, and toss that bracket for low profile on there and toss it inside the AGP slot because all it has is VGA as well. And I wonder if anything different would happen. All right, let's try this again. Yeah, see, if you don't click on the window, it'll redirect you. So you have to watch out. All right, 640 by 480. Okay. 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 Now I can go ahead and quit the game. Now that the setting is set, now I gotta turn off MSN internet access. Get out of here. MSN can go shove itself up in the recycle bin.
That's the only annoying thing about this game, is you have to do that before you even try to play the game, because if you try to change the graphics settings later, it'll redirect you to Internet Explorer, which is so annoying. Dang it. Well, that one works. Yeah, I wouldn't go any higher than 640 by 480 on a Pentium 2 system. Good morning, and welcome to the Black Mesa Transit System. This automated Look at that. Is provided Not too shabby. And convenience of the Black Although, Mesa being that it is in direct 3D mode, the textures aren't the nearly as high resolution. So you get kind of blurry textures. And it could be because the video memory is low on the system. It's only got 4 megabytes. I suppose if I tossed in that NVIDIA card, I would get high-res textures, but I don't. Although, well, let's go back here and go to configuration, video, video options, draw faster software sprites. Ooh, let's try that. A3D hardware, EAX hardware support. I don't even know if this thing has that sort of stuff on the onboard sound card. Come on, computer. Gotta wait for all the textures to load. <laughs> but yeah, definitely a Pentium 2 can handle this game very well. It could probably benefit from having a Pentium 3, but being that I haven't touched any of the hardware on this computer, it's doing a phenomenal job. I imagine it's probably because of the low amount of RAM that this thing has that, you know, it can't run as well as it should. But the fact is, it runs, so hey, that's pretty good. I did install Mozilla Firefox version 2.0.0.20, which is the latest version that Windows Millennium Edition, as well as Windows 98, first edition and second edition support. Just so that way I'd have some form of an internet browser, at least until I can get, a, you know, the latest version of Opera for Windows Millennium, which I believe is version like 10.63 or something like that. Obviously, with 128 megs of RAM, Firefox is going to churn like a coffee grinder making coffee into ground. Coffee. If that makes any sense, but it at least run decently, you know, obviously it's not going to be the greatest experience, but it'll do pretty well. But if I could only browse the web, that would be kind of nice, but I can't. But at least I have it on here. Win 9X version 4.9, it can't even properly recognize it's Windows Millennium Edition. Which is odd because it is Windows Millennium Edition, but they just called it Windows 9X. They didn't call it anything fancy, it's just 9X, so... Who knows why they put the version identifier that way. But, you know, obviously if you were going to Winver, it just says Windows Millennium Edition, but, you know, whatever. So, I think for now, that's just going to be the software in a nutshell. There's really nothing on here. This can run Windows Movie Maker, the original version. Just because, here it is, oops. It's going to try and load the demo video here. <laughs> The original Windows Movie Maker. I love that music. <laughs> this is actually an updated version, 1.0.1376. Or that might be actually the original version, 1.0.1376. I don't know. But essentially, this is like a very inexpensive iMovie. You basically, you know, you'd have a Firewire or a TV tuner input card. And basically, you just, you know, record from your DV camera and uh, do it that way. And since I have a big hard drive from the time, I can record up to 83 hours. So basically it's just DV capture, you import it into here, because I don't think you can otherwise put in anything. You have to you have to press the record button and you have to record it off a camcorder. Although this computer would probably not be the fastest thing at all to edit video. As a matter of fact, I think it'd just really not do so good on it at all. But you know, it's a 350 megahertz Pentium 2, so I guess it's not terrible. But DirectX Diagnostics will tell us it's a 350 megahertz Pentium 2, 128 megs of RAM. Now, one thing that's interesting about this system is that um, it does have uh, dip switches on the board to configure the speed of the processor, so I imagine somebody could actually upgrade the clock speed just by, you know, switching some jumpers around. I'm not sure if that's true or not. 
But this is essentially a 3D version of the ATI Mach 64 with upgraded video memory. That's essentially what this card is, the very first Rage graphics card from ATI, because otherwise they were called the Mach 64. But since this is the 3D version, it's the Rage Pro. So let's try some direct 3D here. Not too shabby, actually. Was that software rendering or, or something? All right, here's hardware accelerated rendering. How's this do? Oh, beautiful. It could obviously do the hardware rendering versus the software rendering because the software rendering is just slow. And then for music, let's try the old FM synthesizer. Why is one louder than the other? I don't know. I suppose I should actually get a proper drive from Compaq or HP at this point. Well, we know that works. So how about the standard MIDI mapper? See if that makes a difference. Either way, the MIDI sounds a hell of a lot better on this system than it did on the Packard Bell, but then again, it's slightly newer and the MIDI's more advanced. I suppose I could actually take my Sound Blaster AW64 Gold and toss it in this computer, and then I'd have a badass Windows Millennium Edition computer. Because that's what I was thinking about for this machine, because it's got all those expansion slots. It has the proper onboard dedicated graphics and it also runs windows millennium edition rather well actually on 128 megs of ram it's actually not running half bad um i'm thinking i might just make this the ultimate windows millennium edition computer or something absurd like that i don't know um the only problem is is that should i stick with mental if i should blah, 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 if i can get my words correct um should i stick with millennium edition or should i go back to 98 because both of them run about the same i was thinking because windows millennium edition has newer versions of web browsers and it also has newer driver support and is guaranteed like compatible with directx 9.0 c and all that stuff i know it's probably not the best version of windows but it's functional and it has a lot more multimedia support. And it also has that joke of a video editor known as Windows Movie Maker. And it's got a bunch of other things like the very broken System Restore, which I'll show you guys that real quick. If you've never seen System Restore, well, that's what it looks like. That's the very first version. And it sort of worked. They had the concept, but Microsoft really didn't implement it very well. It didn't work as well as it should have back in the day as what I remember hearing about Millennium Edition. But either way, that's it for now. Um, I think what I'm gonna go ahead and look at here in the device manager, because I know the system, like I was mentioning earlier, it doesn't shut off on its own. So I'm not sure what the deal is with that and why it doesn't shut down on its own. I'm not entirely sure, but when you go to shut it down. Oh, I gotta eject the half-life disk. It shuts down like it should, obviously, but then it just goes to the, it's now safe to turn off your computer screen. And Pentium 2 PCs by this point already had ACPI support, but maybe this thing actually predated that standard. I'm not sure. As I know, AT-based systems, they obviously had to physically turn off the system via the power switch, but this has a soft power switch. So I'm not sure why there's no ACPI support. I don't know if it just requires some kind of special driver in order to enable that, because I believe the system was one of those that was the on now compatible standard. Because I know Windows 98 had this thing called On Now, which was basically just the sleep mode for PCs that had the advanced um, power control management in the system's logic. But I don't know if this one has that or not. It might actually predate that standard. I'm not sure. I'm not going to try and install Windows XP to figure that out. It would run XP just fine. It's got 128 megs of RAM, and Windows XP would probably pick up all the hardware in a jiffy, but I don't know if it's really worth it to check to see if there's any kind of ACPI hardware support, because Windows XP doesn't exactly run ple uh, pleasantly on a Pentium 2 to begin with. I mean, it runs okay on a 400 megahertz Pentium 2, but 
honestly, it's just not worth my time considering that I have other machines that already run XP. And besides, it's really not that big of a deal if I have to turn the computer off. I'm not gonna put it on standby or sleep mode anyway. So if I have to turn it off via the power switch, if I go to shut it down, not a big deal. I don't really care too much. But it's just a curious thought because I, I don't know why it doesn't shut down on its own. It should, because obviously it's probably ACPI or advanced ACPI compliant. But who knows? I haven't bothered to look into it. Maybe it just doesn't because it's predating that standard. I have no idea. I mean, considering it's made in 1998 and, uh, you know, the system that I have, my Persignia, actually has that ACPI support and it actually supports the sleep modes and the advanced control thing and it actually shuts down on its own. So I don't really know. But anyway, that's it for now. I will see you all in the next video, I guess. Ciao.